Okay. So we had a little technical glitch on Sunday. I'm back today to re-record the sermon that some of you were not able to see. I even put on the same shirt so that you would recognize a little cohesiveness there. If you've watched the rest of the worship up to this point, Dave Adamson was standing here reading the story that you heard so well. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. That's how it ends. That's the way Jesus wraps up that story. It makes a good song, The Lost and Found, but the party begins. It's a nice touch. You know if you've read this story, that is not the end of the prodigal son. We still have to deal with the whining brother, um, the idea of the prodigal son coming back and just waltzing into the family as though nothing had changed. That's a fiction. We know that happy families take a lot of work. But some steps are so significant and so powerful they deserve honoring and a celebration. Sometimes you have to acknowledge the progress you've made, have your party, and when the party is over, keep working and keep growing. And this fact of life is one of the things that annoys me most about being a human. It should be, if I was God, and thank all of us that I'm not God and I'm not in charge of this, but if I was in charge of this, when you get to some new level of humanity and progress and abundance, it would be like you climb a ladder and you're on a new floor. End of story. It would be like a scoreboard where you reach a certain level and that's, that's it. It would be like in the first Matrix with Keanu Reeves, I know Kung Fu, I know intergenerational forgiveness, and then you would, you would solve everything. It would be like you learn a lesson, you realize, oh, when someone says that, I feel this way, I do this thing, I hurt these people I love. And when you realize it, all of a sudden, oh, I, I, I hear this thing, and I don't feel this, and I don't do this, and I don't hurt this, and that would be the end of the story. But for no one does the bow get tied up quite like that. The process of growth, the process of abundant life, it never stops. The good news is you can always keep healing. And the bad news is you can always keep healing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm blind. I'm blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. The three-hour tour of growth will go on forever. The good news about that is that you are never alone on that eternal journey. The Holy Spirit, the animating presence of God that directs and guides and inspires us, keeps moving with us. That's great news. But the bad news, and some of you know this so well that it's not bad, but we all get to this point where this feels so overwhelming. The bad news is that the Holy Spirit is relentless. If you give her an inch, she takes a mile. Dear God, I want to work on my anger. Please help me be more peaceful. Amen. We said that prayer. We meant that prayer. But when we lend ourselves to the Holy Spirit, mm, why are you angry? What are you afraid of? Who taught you to be afraid like that? Why didn't you trust them? Why did you trust people who were there offering you negative messages? Who told you to be uh, trusting of them and not trusting of yourself? How can you trust better messages? How can you trust yourself? What is holding you back from trusting more? When is that prayer to not be angry just a psychological veneer about feelings and holding you back from deeper spiritual growth? And when is the anger actually a holy response? And how do you know the difference? And thank you, Holy Spirit. I once felt found, but now I'm lost. She is relentless. The way Jesus describes this is the kingdom of God that you hold in your heart is both near and always coming. Now, for the whole world, it's the same case. For God so loved the world, the big picture, the kingdom of God is something, the wholeness, the peace, the justice, with the presence of the Spirit, it is near, and it's also always coming. And for your one wild and wonderful life, you are always moving in this liminal space, always moving toward the found, and never fully there, at least in this one wild and wonderful life. And I don't think this is fundamentally different, but some of the Buddhist teachers, like Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama, they're really good at describing it in this, in this way. It's not for them going from lost to found to party, to lost to found to party, to lost to found to party. For them, they say, when you are lost, that is when the party begins. 
Being lost is when you are blessed to be able to give in to that relentless spirit that keeps dragging you toward harmony. And the Buddhists say this in ways that just drive me nuts, but it might annoy you too. They say when you get to these emotional and existential crises, that is where you say, thank you, universe. Thank you for putting me in chaos. That is your opportunity to grow. And hasn't these last few years, hasn't these last few years just been such an opportunity to grow? It has been so tiring. For two years, the public health crisis has pressed down on all of our other issues of, of loneliness and fear and trust. For five years, this social political crisis has eroded our sense of security and balance, and we've all had this idea for the direction the world should go according to certain values, and it's not going in that direction. We, we, we feel lost. I think through it all, we aren't careful, and none of us can be careful all the time. When we let the unmanageable pains of the world overshadow the already so difficult to manage pains of our lives, how, how do you hold those both? And how have you felt? Tired? Off? Less patient? Less hopeful? Thanks, God, for all of that at once? But here's the next layer. When you feel scattered and dysregulated, how does that make you feel? When you feel lost, living in this metaphorically distant and ill-fitting world, engaged in activities that are not only unfulfilling, but might be so against your sense of self, when you feel totally at wit's end, how do you pile on shame to that? Shame for not being able to deal with what no one is capable of dealing with. Shame for not having a better plan when no one knows how to navigate this. Prodigal sons and daughters lost in the time of COVID and chaos. I hope you felt the Holy Spirit drawing you back, but even on that return, your shame so often sticks like a shadow. I'm a bad person. I'm unworthy. I need to work it off somehow. Now for me, and I say that the difference between spirituality and religion is when someone can say, me too, all of a sudden we're together. Togetherness is that difference of meeting God. For me, all through COVID, I keep beating myself up. Me too, me too at home. For me, there are things both practical and emotional I used to handle them really well. I was good. I was good at life. And now I can't seem to do that so smoothly all the time. Me too. For me, uh, I haven't um, known that I've had COVID. I haven't had the symptoms that people talk about. And y'all don't know me well enough to recognize any of these differences. But for the last couple of months, maybe I had asymptomatic COVID several months ago because I have been dealing with the things that people call a COVID fog. I find myself more forgetful. I find myself confused. I find myself mad at myself for not being myself. And I keep telling myself it's stress. Oh, it's got to be stress. I mean, there's a lot of challenges right now. It's just stress. It's causing the brain to do things. I tell myself, I'm getting older. I'm not really that old, but I am getting older. And maybe it's that. Or whatever it is, it has to be my fault. And for me, so many of the stories I tell myself, almost everything that goes wrong has to be my fault. Me too. And notice the prodigal son is not a story about one man and one man's hands. It's not just a story about what goes on in any one person's head. It is a story about relationships. It is a story of shame, and we are ruled in shame. And the beauty of the story is when other people, like the dad, runs and forgives and comforts. The good news in the difficult times of life is that we are made to be in good relationships, and that can feel so redemptive. The bad news, at least for me, the more we feel that we need people, the less we're able to trust people. Me too. In the last five years in this job, in jobs I've had like this, I have seen more tears, I've heard more complaints, I've been asked more questions, not about religion, not about health, even though cancer runs wild everywhere, not even about injustice and the deep complexities of injustice that we've seen through the last year. But the main issue that I've dealt with in pastoral care is broken relationships. Every family, nearly every friend circle, has been tense. 
because of the stark clarity of moral division in our world, which hurts, in which there's no formula for how to deal with that. There's books on how to be kind, there's small advice on how to deal with this or that, but none of them is a silver bullet. Even with people on your side, people you respect, people who should be a port in the storm of your life, even those relationships have been frayed because we're not graceful to each other anymore. We have forgotten how to listen gracefully, how to, how to let bumps smooth over. And it comes out as blame and accusation, and that bump becomes a rift, and all of a sudden the places that should be supportive become so tense. And for me, I am tired of losing friends, and I'm tired of feeling hopeless about it, and I'm tired of being of there being fewer and fewer people to run and embrace. Me too. We are tired. We are ashamed. We are ashamed of being tired. We are ashamed that we don't know how to stop being tired, and that just makes us more tired. You know what the thing Buddhists tell us that this is exactly where the party begins. Because when you're lost, this is a chance to get found. I think that is why we come to places like this. Sometimes it's a message, it's usually not. Sometimes it's the music that someone plays, it's the fellowship that some people have, maybe, yeah, that, that definitely has an effect. Sometimes it's the chance to do meaningful outreach and to be part of a community that is trying to shape a better world. Once in a while that draws us here. Sometimes really amazing people, the, the, the ones that sing to my heart, they come here to create an alternative rhythm to the world that's out there. But for anyone, no matter what you think brings you in here, for everyone, on any Sunday, no matter what I say, no matter what they play, no matter how we pray, this is a chance to be lost together. This is a space to remind ourselves that we can be softer to each other and we should be softer to ourselves because God's grace keeps chasing us. This is a sacred space to remind ourselves that our excuses are just excuses. God sees deeper than that in all of us. This is a sacred space to welcome our beaten souls, wherever they are today, to release our deepest and heaviest weight, even for a moment, so that we might see the promise of light and a path back. What that would be like to walk that path for six days outside of this Sunday, I don't know. What that would be like to walk that path for six minutes after you leave this building would be hard enough. Reconciliation is hard work, it's long work, but I hope and I pray that maybe you can take a step, one step, wherever you are on that journey, to release some shame, to trust God's dream is better for you than even you can.